Well, hello class, this is Dr. Adam Hughes with you again, and I'm so excited that you're with me today and specifically this week as we in earnest begin the content of our course, Church Leadership and Administration. And today we are in uh, week one, unit one. And so thank you so much for being here. And just overall, thank you so much for walking through this course with us. I think we have some exciting material for you. And specifically today, what we're going to look at, I think beyond just the academic side of it, I think from your perspective will be very helpful as someone that's been called to ministry. With that in mind, the title of our lecture today, the title of the subject matter we're looking at is Answering God's Call. And I would just say to begin with, I understand as one who's been called by God and struggled through that and has kind of had a change of course of direction a couple times, I understand how daunting and sometimes confusing and, and at other times even frustrating it can be. So I really hope today what we talk about, what we look at, what you're reading and what you'll see on the PowerPoint can help you begin to clarify some of those things and, and instead of adding this weight on your shoulders, begin to alleviate some of that weight on your shoulders. As we get started, really what I'd like to do before I begin to look at the content today, I would just encourage you if, uh, if you have a Bible to grab that, maybe a pen and paper so you can take notes. And then also we've provided for you in this unit the PowerPoint file. It, it might be good. I'm not going to go over everything that's on that PowerPoint file that we've provided there for you. But it might be good just for you to take notes and to follow along. If you need to, to pause the video, go download that PowerPoint, and then have that printed out as we walk together for just a few moments through this content. So I'll give you just a second to do that, and then uh, we'll pick back up with the information. All right, well, welcome back. And uh, as we're talking about today, we're specifically looking at your call to ministry. And we want to answer this question as it relates to answering God's call. And as we do that, I just want to just want to read a couple questions to you that I want you to reflect on and think about as you think about your own personal call to ministry. Here, here are some things that maybe as we get started would be helpful to you. Why is it that a call to ministry is often so difficult to discern? To say it another way, why do so many people struggle to know specifically what they have been called to do? Perhaps even more foundational than that is, what do we even mean by a call to ministry? And then I'm sure in your life you're thinking about this more directly. Specifically, how do you know when you've been called, and what it is that you've been called to do. There are probably a lot of things that we could say uh, to answer those questions, but I think just in general, as we consider God's Word, I, I think there are probably three statements that we can make that are pretty safe for all people that have been called to ministry. One of the things that I would say to you is if you just take a survey of leadership, those that have been called in the Bible as a whole in both the Old and the New Testament, Here's what we would say, there's not a monolithic way or a monolithic task specifically that God calls all people to. In other words, we would say Moses' call was quite different than Peter's. Yet at the same time, we would, we would recognize that both when they had been called, definitively knew they had been called. So with that in mind, just consider a few thoughts, maybe three statements in reference to these questions that we've looked at and asked. First of all, I think one of the statements we can make about a call to ministry is God's call is always relevant to the time. Uh, you can look at different passages of Scripture. I won't read this, but one I've referenced is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 9. What do I mean that God's call is always relevant to the time? I would say you're always doing ministry in a specific location in a specific time. In other words, it's not just generic. I, I mean, yes, there's this call of God of all believers to that are called to discipleship and follow Him. All of that's true, but no, when we've been called to serve Him, it's not in a vacuum. We've been called at this time for this purpose, and so I think it's helpful to remember that. Secondly, and related, God's call is always related to people in that time. So think about what God says to Saul, we know him as the Apostle Paul, in his salvation experience and call to ministry in Acts chapter 9. Uh, he, tells, he tells him through an, another servant that 
you're going to suffer greatly for my name and you're going to bear my name before kings and Gentiles and, and, and all of these things. And so even at, at Saul's conversion, he was told that his ministry was specifically, yes, it was to the Jews, but it's going to be to bear God's name before kings, leaders, and Gentiles. And so it, it's, it's God specifically saying you're, you're called to a people as a preacher one of the things I say, and maybe this will help you make sense of it, is you preach and teach. You're not just preaching and teaching a sermon or a lesson. You're preaching a sermon to people. And you can't get away when you're thinking about that from the people you're preaching it to. If you, if you do, you're not going to be very effective. And so we understand you're called to a specific time, but you're also called to a specific people. Now, the last thing I would say here just as a general rule is the content of your call may take years to, to, fully divine, to, to fully define and develop. Now, why do I say that? Well, that's, I think that's okay. I think sometimes we, we feel the pressure. If I'm called, I need to know exactly what the rest of my life's gonna look like. I, I'm, I'm in seminary, God's placed me here, so I certainly need to be able to tell people exactly what I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing. But I don't think that's always how it works. I think God calls us and He just expects us to walk through the door and be faithful to what He's put in front of us at the time. And there's a chance that that might change. And, 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 and as long as we're obeying what God has called us to do, the application of it might change from time to time. It might develop. I, I would just say of me personally, I never thought I was called to be a full-time seminary professor. I thought I was called to pastor. And so I did that. I walked through those doors. But then when the time came for me to come to New Orleans, God made that clear. And now in some of, this, in some of the same ways, I'm, I'm still serving him the same way. It's just the application of it and the and the environment of it is a little bit different, and that's okay. I say this to people all the time. I think sometimes if God told us what the rest of our life was gonna look like or what it's gonna be like 40 years from now, it would be hard for us to just obey Him right now. And in your call and, and just in your following of Jesus in general, He wants you to obey Him right now, trusting that He'll work all of those things out. So as we think about this call to ministry and we kind of delve into all of those things, those are just some general statements that I think we can affirm from Scripture. But what I'd like to spend just a few moments with the rest of our time doing today is to look at a specific passage of Scripture that certainly, yes, we could say is related to those that are called to vocational ministry, but in some ways it's just related to anybody that's called to be a disciple. And I'd like us to look at this passage, and then what I'd like, like to do is make just five brief statements or axioms from this passage of Scripture that will help you understand and reflect on your call to ministry. Now, I, I would say to you, you can get more information about this. I, I'll just give you kind of an overview here. You can get more information on it in chapter one of the book, Together We Lead, which is one of the textbooks for the course. But with that in mind, the passage of Scripture that I'm referring to is Matthew chapter 16, and specifically verses 21 through 28. Now, just for context, let me read this text in its entirety, and it's a passage that you'll know very, very well. Here's what we begin to see in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it for me, Lord, far be it for you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall, it, uh, what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Verse 28, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And just very quickly, I, I, so we think about this call to serve. I, I want us to consider just five quick axioms that I think do help us understand or at least ask some questions about our call to ministry. First of all, just remember the context of this. This is when Jesus has taken His disciples north of the Sea of Galilee about 15 to 18 miles to a city that the ruins of which you can still see to this day, uh, Caesarea Philippi. And there 
He asked them, who do people say that I am? And this is where Peter confesses the Christ. And then Jesus says something really interesting there. And we might even wonder, what is he talking about? And why does it take him to Caesarea Philippi to say this? He says, basically, you're right. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Well, what seems so strange about that statement is normally like today, when we think of gates, it's a defensive mechanism, not an offensive weapon. So how is it that the gates of Hades won't prevail or overtake the church? Well, to understand this, you have to look, know a little bit about the, the setting of Caesarea Philippi. And I think Jesus took his disciples there intentionally to teach them about their call and following him and serving him. On the back side of that city, even today, there is a spring that flows out of the bottom of a cliff, out of the bottom of a mountain, and kind of creates a river that runs through the ruins of that city. And back in Jesus' day and time, that cave and that spring and that river and crossing over that cave was known as the Gates of Hades. Now, what's interesting is people actually believe they needed coinage when they died to be ferried across to the other side. Right next, if you're looking at that, if you're looking at that cave or that cliff, right next to this gates of Hades up on the cliff are some ruins of some Greek temple gods. The perhaps most notorious of which is the god Pan, who may have been the most despicable of all gods because even child sacrifice was offered to Pan there. I think when Jesus says, that you're correct, that this is right, and upon this rock, upon this confession of me being the Christ, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In some ways, what Jesus is saying is all of the secularism, all of the paganism of the world, all the false religions that tries to come after people's soul and, and will try to come after the church, those things that are represented there in Caesarea Philippi will not prevail against Jesus' church. And then it's out of this context that I want to show you Jesus gives us five axioms that we can know regarding our call to ministry just very, very quickly. And you, you can reference back to the chapter in the book, but you can also reference back to the passage. Number one, the context of the call to serve is the service of the gospel. Notice that Jesus then begins to talk about their going to Jerusalem to die. And Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, let this not happen. But then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the same things of man. And what Jesus seems to be indicating is that what he's going to do and what the church is going to be built on is this gospel act that's going to happen in Jerusalem. And therefore, this call to ministry that he's calling his disciples and us to follow is this gospel proclamation. So first and foremost, we must understand that our call is always the context of the gospel. Number two, notice in verse 24 that the call is first and foremost an invitation to follow a person. It's not just an invitation to follow a set of beliefs or, or gather with other people or be associated with the church, although all those things may be true. But Jesus specifically says, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Look, of all things that we might do in ministry, we need to remember that we're called to follow Jesus. Whatever you do, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you do or don't know about your call to ministry, understand that you're called to follow Jesus. Number three, the content is a command to lose your life. Verse 24 there that I just referenced where Jesus says, Now yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Understand, we, we think of taking up your cross in our context as being a metaphor. Okay, just, you know, just like... Jesus went to the cross physically, that we, we, we take up our cross and our cross is our service of him daily. Well, understand that they would not have understood it that way. That back then, the, the only reference they had to, to taking up the cross was carrying your cross to the spot of your Roman crucifixion. And so there's a real sense in which Jesus is saying, when you're called to follow me, you need to understand you're called to lose your life for my sake. And we might certainly not, many of us won't physically lose our life, but it is a call to lose our life. Number four, as daunting as that might be, we understand that the comfort is a promise that we won't lose our soul. Verses 25 through 27, Jesus might say some strange things here that we don't completely understand, but basically what he's saying is your soul, the person's soul, is the most valuable possession they have. So what does it gain to profit the world but lose your soul, and what would someone give for their soul? And then he references several passages from the Old Testament where he equates himself with God and having the right to come in judgment. And essentially what I believe he's saying is, look, if you, if you follow him and you serve him, whatever you might have to give up in your life, 
You keep your soul, which is a net gain. We might lose our life for Jesus, but we gain our soul, and that's a net gain. And so Jesus is giving this comfort. Whatever we might lose in this place, if we know Him and follow Him and serve Him, we have Him, and that's enough. And then finally, verse 28, finally, the certainty is a guarantee of the realized kingdom. Now, Jesus said, some of you are standing here that won't taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And there's been a lot of debate as to what Jesus means about that. Who are the, those standing here and what does He mean by the coming of the kingdom? Well, we can, we can get into all those debates, but certainly what Jesus seems to be indicating is our service and following Him will ultimately lead, and Matthew's gospel points this out, there's, a, there's an already part to the kingdom, there's a not yet that's coming, and as we serve Him, we, uh, number one, live in that kingdom, but we have a role in proclaiming that kingdom and bringing that kingdom about. So as we think about our call to ministry, we specifically might not know what we're going to be doing 20 years from now, but we can know that we're to serve the gospel, we're to follow a person, we're not to be afraid of losing our life, because we have the promise of Jesus keeping our soul, and we get to be a part of one of the greatest things that this world has ever seen, and that's building the kingdom of God. And all of those things, if we'll do that, I would say the other things have a way of falling into place. Just two thoughts here really quickly as we summarize. Notice in calling them, Jesus showed His disciples that following Him was difficult, but it's worth it. Can I tell you that following Jesus is difficult? But friend, it's worth it. There's no greater thing you could give your life to than following Jesus and serving Jesus. And then number two, answering God's call to follow Jesus is life-altering, but ultimately, it's in Jesus' hands. The PowerPoint there, there are a few questions. There are four or five questions based on what we see in Matthew 16 where I want you to pause and I want you to reflect. You might even get a notepad out and make some notes as you answer those questions. And I want you, before you go a step further in this course, you don't have to know all of the ins and outs of your call, but just reflect on these truths, these axioms that we learned from Matthew 16 to try to understand where you are with Jesus and how you can grow to understand your call, what it means, and be more committed to it. Thanks for being with me this week, and we'll see you again next time.